Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Jules Gleason, one of the co-editors and a contributor to the new book, Transgender Marxism, published by Pluto Press in May of this year, 2021, along with another contributor to the book, Michelle O'Brien. Jules Joanne Gleason is a writer, comedian, and historian. She has published essays and outlets including Viewpoint Magazine, Invert Journal, and Vice, and performed internationally at a wide range of communist and queer cultural events. Emmy O'Brien writes at the intersection of communist theory, trans liberation, LGBTQ social movement studies, and feminism. Michelle is a co-editor of PINKO, and her writing has appeared in Social Movement Studies, Work, Employment in Society, Commune, Homintern, and Notes and Invert. Transgender Marxism was published in May 2021 by Pluto Press. It's a book that brings together transgender studies and Marxist theory, exploring trans lives and movements, and surviving as trans under capitalism. In the end, the claim of the book is that for trans liberation, capitalism must be abolished. In this interview, we talk about the collective material process of transition, trans visibility, assimilation, and liberation, the history of gay liberation and trans movements, being trans in the workplace, care work and family abolition, and trans solidarities against capitalism and the state. This week, instead of words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain, I'd like to just share the info that Sean has been transferred back to Ohio, his state of capture, from Virginia, where he has been held at a medium security facility for the last two and a half years. It's assumed that he's back at the Supermax OSP Youngstown for two weeks of quarantine and a determination of status to decide what prison he will go to inside of Ohio. When he was leaving Ohio for Virginia, he was close to graduating to a lower security, medium level, which was the same level as he was held at in Virginia. So folks are hoping, since there haven't been any serious breaches of conduct or anything since his transfer, that he'll hopefully be headed down to an easier and more comfortable facility than the one that he's currently at. For more information, you can write him at his old address, where I'm sure that he'd love to hear some kind words and maybe some books. It's listed in the show notes as well as posted on seanswain.org, but here it is anyway. Sean Swain, number A243205, OSP Youngstown. 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. You can donate to his legal case to challenge his denied parole by sending money via Cash App to dollar sign Swainiac1969. And you can also follow at Swainiac1969 on Instagram for more information on the upcoming online raffle to help fundraise for Sean's legal fees. To donate items for the raffle, also, you can contact that same Instagram mentioned above and keep an eye out for more info. As an update to prior mentions of the Swainiac Fest, it was a success, but is only a step towards covering the legal fees to get him the best legal defense possible. And remember, you can fundraise towards that $12,500 needed by the lawyer on your own or in your community. And if you don't have Cash App but you want to send the money, you can send it to The Final Straw's Venmo or PayPal or other means you could send it via a money order um, sent to our post box, which is nice and vaguely anonymous. If you do so and it's for Sean's legal defense, just put a note in the memo, something that we won't mind bringing to the bank. So I'm super excited to talk to um, an editor and a contributor to this new, really exciting volume, Transgender Marxism, um, which was published by Pluto Press. Um, I want to just first ask you to introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, any affiliation that you would like the listeners to know about. Hi, so I am Jules Gleason, and I am one of the co-editors of Transgender Marxism, this new collection um, we're here to chat about. My pronouns are she, and I am um, suppose only very loosely affiliated to <laughs> things at the moment. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to be joining you today. Hello, uh, my name is Michelle O'Brien, uh, and I am a contributor to the volume, uh, a chapter on trans work and uh, experiences of trans people in employment, both formal and informal. And I also, uh, that 
chapter I wrote uh, draws heavily from the New York City Trans Oral History Project that I worked with for some years. Um, I write communist theory, teach queer studies at Gallatin and work as a psychoanalyst, um, and my pronouns are she and her. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk with me today. I'm really excited. I, this book was like, a, uh, I did a deep reading of it, and it, was, it really helped me um, think through my own positionality in the world. Um, so I'm excited to kind of dive into a lot of the ideas in there. Um, so starting off right away, one thing that keeps coming up in the book throughout different contributors' pieces is the question of how transness might be useful for capital. And this is like being posed after this quote unquote transgender tipping point where there's more visibility specifically, I think for trans women and more understanding of transness, I guess, in mainstream worlds, although that might be questionable. So I'm, I'm just wondering if like, just to start the discussion, what you think are relative or limited or positive gains made by trans people as a result of this increase in visibility? Yeah, I'm happy to begin that. So for those of you listening at home who are not familiar with it, the transgender tipping point was a phase around, I suppose, 2014 to 2015, most notably this, this famous Times cover of Levan Cox, the star of Orange is the New Black, appearing on Time. And the transgender tipping point is kind of pretty loosely this, this moment when suddenly there was an increase, like a surge of popular familiarity, let's say, with transgender culture and transgender experiences and after which well to me the most obvious difference is like after which trans people seem to become a lot more numerous which is measurable every in everything from people applying to become patients of gender identity clinics to transgender specific communities seeming to swell in size and there's all kinds of ways we can talk about the measurement of it but um clearly at this point somewhere around yeah, we could say 2013 to 2015, things transformed pretty rapidly and seemingly permanently towards what had been a cluster of different subcultural circles becoming something more like a mass culture. Well, that's my own reading. Yeah, I think for both myself and Michelle, this wasn't kind of like our point of departure into transgender circles or transgender discussions. However, like clearly the, the kind of like the transgender question, I suppose, transformed uh, thereafter. And the work of this collection is very much sort of following on in the wake of that and sort of in, in the confusion that follows uh, and is continuing to follow on from that. So I'll say a bit. In the far queer and trans left in New York City, there's a pretty well-developed critique of the trans tipping point that centers around a number of points. One is this discrepancy between popular media attention on things, uh, on trans people and the actual material conditions, social service infrastructure, material well-being, violence against trans people. And so there's uh, certainly a disjunction between the two and where there might be a lot of progress made in a symbolic popular media realm that only occasionally corresponds to any material progress made in the lives of working class people. And even when we're talking about sort of material progress, I think there's been a lot of good thinking around how, for example, anti-discrimination legislation that we recently won in New York City a few years ago doesn't actually protect people very effectively against being highly marginalized in the employment market because of the dynamics of at-will employment and the sort of broader forces of oppression and racism in society. And so, you know, we can, we can kind of recognize the limits of sort of both liberal equality and liberal celebration liberal recognition. And I think people are very right to, to point out and to call attention to the trans liberation, trans well-being, trans life has to be something more than getting on magazine covers and having famous people mention the existence of trans people. I will also say that I think that it's the increased visibility has had dramatic and substantial benefits. And one of the stark ones Jules mentioned was, is the increase in the numbers of trans people. That part of the dynamics of trans life is at any given time, there are probably a lot of people out there who have internally and privately a trans experience that they are not 
yet able to act on in the world, to come out, to transition, to find other trans people, to talk about their experience. And I it's certainly in my work as an analyst, I certainly encounter a lot of people in this situation. And the level of increased visibility just has dramatic implications of enabling a lot more people to find each other and to build life together in ways that I think are very powerful. And then the other is I think there actually has been a dramatic and substantial increase in trans organizing and trans movement building that's happened concurrently and that has uh, taken Black trans leadership and communities very seriously in some ways. I think the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is one of the most substantially trans-inclusive political struggles I've ever seen, more inclusive than I would say than most LGBT rights organizations uh, and organizing. And I think that Black Lives Matter has been very, very powerful in moving money, attention, and support to Black trans-led movements and helped out a lot in gaining political ground in a variety of ways, whether that means money or specific policy reforms or much broader level of attention and infrastructure, which obviously we have quite a long ways to go, but we're out in the streets and in struggle together. And that the tipping point has been a sort of dimension of this uh, political process unfolding that has dangers, that has backlash, backlash that has what in the words of one anthology, a trap door, but also has some really quite powerful opportunities and advances. Yeah, thanks for mapping out. Well, first that historical moment that we're like in the wake of, and then the kind of the complexities of visibility, um, how that can bring good things in and also cause some harm. But I also think it's really important as you noted to, to talk about the like kind of black trans leadership or um, we see in, in movements, um, that's a different kind of visibility than the media or like, you know, like TV show kind of visibility that the tipping point refers to. Now the book, um, there was one thing that uh, Jules, you and your uh, co-editor Al O'Rourke write in the introduction, um, if trans life can't be eradicated, it can be normalized and disciplined. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of interested in this, this like, I don't know if you have more to say about this kind of double-edged sword where there is, there are these gains, but there's also maybe a risk of um, what we saw with like gay liberation becoming, um, you know, a movement for marriage equality. Um, so uh, I was wondering what either or both of you had to think, say about this as a potential moment of capture or by, by capital, by the state. Can we be distracted in ways by like the sort of the way that like transness can be stylized and then normalized and then sold back to us or um, or where is there also i guess hope for that the resistance to that capture yeah i'm happy to talk about this bit of the introduction yeah sadly Al couldn't join us today but this was uh the introduction of something we co-wrote together and i suppose just to say one more word on black lives matter there's kind of like what the introduction is trying to capture is that once we have these remarkable and like unpredictable breakthroughs breakthroughs that sometimes are quite hard to keep track of and last summer when Black Lives Matter was in full swing was definitely one of these cases so this is kind of one of the moments we touch upon the sort of cleaning of the house moment that brought around the Black Trans Lives Matter rally in Brooklyn and this is kind of like the this is like the optimistic aspect of it is that there's all of these uh, insurgent kind of intersectional connections which are just sort of being put into motion rather than just kind of like theorized I think like Michelle was saying like we're just kind of getting out onto the streets some of the time but the other aspect is kind of like the there needs to also be a realistic assessment of what's standing in our way and sort of what you're flagging up here is this section where we talk about the family about private households and this is I think still a uh, still an intractable and still like probably where I don't know if it's the majority of the harm that trans people encounter but definitely like any group of trans people you meet if you talk to them about their relationships with their parents, extended families, even the friendship circles they've grown up with. Yeah, I think maybe maybe a minority will have had fortunate or blessed experiences, you know what I mean? So this is sort of like this this passage which you're sort of flagging up that like the repression and disciplining and I suppose to sort of what to draw back to what Michelle was just saying, this kind of like privatization of transgender experiences where many people are allowed to sort of furtively and secretly live out the lives they want to live 
but then among the people maybe who raised them, the people who they grew up around, they have to then don another face, don another attire. I think that's something which, yeah, I think that's something which there's no reason to believe that that is going to transform uh, anytime soon. And that's kind of like, well, maybe like, maybe like Michelle would want to say some more about it. But so specifically, the, what we're trying to do in this introduction is address this, address this family, address like private life as part of political life, right? Which is a familiar concern for anyone, especially anyone who's read feminist history. But uh, we use a particular framework drawn from Angela Petropoulos, who's got this, what, uh, what she writes about it is like economia. So like the binding and normative rules that appear in these private households. And that's kind of like one way which we're trying to approach um, this broader question, which is then returned to in many different ways throughout the rest of the collection. This basically this question of how can it be that exactly what's supposed to be apolitical or depolitical or like the safe haven from political and capitalism, the household, our upbringings, our private lives, how can it be that those places are sort of what any trans politics has to work through before it even exists, right? Before we can even like take to the streets, <laughs> like openly most of the time. So yeah, that's that's kind of like, that's what that's what this introduction is trying to get at, but I'm, I'm sure Michelle has some stuff to say as well. The introduction Jules reference sort of substantively engages this question of the family. And you had another question, Scott, around thinking about family and family abolition. And family abolition, I think, is a very powerful way of trying to think through these pieces alongside each other, both sort of thinking about the overall circuits of labor markets and capitalist society that the family plays a really integral role in, and then thinking about how nested within that the kind of violence and tyranny and brutality that trans people face within so many structures of family. And part of the dynamics of the privacy of the family is that it's very difficult to make inroads in there. Like that there's, uh, that that people are able to constitute a level of family that, or a form of family that's protected against a certain kind of outside scrutiny, a certain kind of attention, a certain space of political struggle. And that a lot of our political movements are kind of oriented to the state, perhaps oriented to employers, perhaps oriented to civil society, and it becomes much more difficult to think in political terms about what it takes to transform family. And like the some of the dynamics of the workplace or some of the dynamics of the state, I think this is a real limit for contemporary social movements that we are sort of trying to figure out how to politicize and transform these spaces that are that have deep structural dynamics in the reproduction of collective life. And it's part, I think, of what leads a lot of trans people to sort of be interested in science fiction, to be interested in kind of revolutionary politics in a more dramatic sense, to be interested in thinking about what, what could it mean to actually come up against and move beyond these limits. The experience of being trans within this sort of bourgeois ideal of a white family that is still upheld, even though it, it kind of contradicts the reality of what people are experiencing. Actually, there's one way that you put it in the introduction, um, talking about how families serve a purpose of a kind of, let me pull it up, I had the quote. You talk about how the family serves uh, not only in this like moral sense that is the way that is often talked about, but also in an economic sense as the project of neoliberal debt imperialism. That's like kind of allowing the state to continue to kind of throw people to dispensable um, situations and somehow maintain itself while doing less and less. So I guess my question is about how this historical point we're in, where there's like more and more trans people, there's still this relic of the family, but the family is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. How does like transness come in as a way to like disrupt that? How can we use that? Uh, use our like, there's the increased visibility, the increased um, struggle, trans struggle, to continue to work against that, like that kind of stranglehold of the family, not simply morally, but also economically, politically. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. And in terms of like us addressing the bourgeois family, obviously like, yeah, the abolition of the bourgeois family is kind of something which is not specific to radical trans theory or anything like that. It also appears in the communist manifesto, obviously. And this was something which, yeah, various figures in the first international were committed to and published about in their writing in various ways. So like, but kind of what's being talked about at this point is the bourgeois family, as in this type of household, which uh, brings up the new generation, but also like transfers wealth and assets and fixed capital 
from one generation to the next, right? So when like the introduction is talking about the contemporary phase, well, yeah, very much what we're drawing from is this extensive like decades of work now that's been done looking at the new right where clearly the political framework the new right had envisioned was not only about the strong state but also about strong families and um this is still this is still very much like evident today like if you tune into Tucker Carlson he's not only talking about how like the police need to be given powers to put down Black Lives Matter he's also last time I tuned in he's also complaining about how you know, today your kid's probably a stoner because weed is legal. So your, your kid's got bloodshot eyes over the dinner table and stuff like that. This is still like part of the right wing imaginary, kind of part of the right wing horizon is that families need to be strengthened up and there needs to be more authority against generations and fear disruption there. One of the things you said there is like, obviously, um, Marx didn't really talk about white families. And this is something which I suppose this is something which which more kind of came onto the abolitionist horizon from work like Hortense Spillers. So Hortense Spillers is Black feminist critique, which is kind of identifying how, especially in the American context, or specifically in the American context, what's being transferred across generations for Black families through much of US history is not wealth and not fixed assets, but exactly legal dispossession. So like unpersonhood, being unpersoned and so on, across is exactly what's being transferred from one generation to the next. So yeah, I, I kind of, <laughs> I think I've run out of things to say at this point, but that, that's the reason I, well, the, the reason I suppose that this is, that family abolitionist politics has been of relevance to me and several other people in the collection is exactly because there is this, there is this moment where I feel like a lot of the existing left has sort of strayed from the first international in ways which I think are a shame and <laughs> ways which we can sort of reunite with these questions of gender and household oppression quite easily. So um yeah, that's kind of my own project anyway. I'm writing a book on family abolition for Pluto at the moment and sort of in it full swing, uh, as Jules knows and other people knows. And so I have uh, just an enormous amount to say about all of this, and I don't want to take up our podcast time talking about it too much at length. Uh, but a few points. One is Jules referenced in the introduction referenced the family as a site of privatized social reproduction. And I think that it's very helpful to think about the family, not just in terms of a sort of normative ideal that's imposed through policy, that's aspired to by people, a sort of ideological form that exists on the right uh, and as well in culturally conservative sections of the left, but also uh, the family just concretely who do you live with? Who do you share whatever limited resources you have available? If you're not able to work, who are you dependent on that you actually know? Who do you cook for? Who cooks for you? Like these questions of really concrete social reproduction that can be done entirely in the market to some extent could hypothetically be done at in various historical times and for specific strata through a kind of welfare structure or a state structure, but overwhelmingly are done through forming relationships of care, dependency, coercion, intimacy with specific people in our lives. And that the vast majority of children are raised in this kind of structure, the vast, you know, that people have these privatized households and that there's all sorts of political implications for that. And one of those political implications is that it, it's a total growing up as a queer or trans youth, as a gender nonconforming child. If you are unlucky enough to end up in an extremely unsupportive household, things are bad. And there's very few opportunities for collective intervention in how to change that, that it's insulated from a certain kind of struggle and a certain kind of collective transformation, um, which is a, a tremendous problem for liberatory movements and how we think about them. In terms of race and white supremacy, uh, Jules mentioned Schwartz and Spillers. I, uh, I've been very inspired by the work of Tiffany Lefebo King, who sort of rereads Schwartz and Spillers and Afro-pessimism and thinking about race and gender in terms of family abolitionism. And I think there's a way of reading that the history, both the history of enslavement and the history of the pathologization of Black families in the United States in terms of an imposition of a kind of white norm that like demonizes and pathologizes certain kinds of kinship structures coupled to an actual apparatus of state violence, of economic violence, of historically slavery, really fragmenting kin relationships. 
and that there is a dynamic, a dialectic in the history of anti-racist, anti-capitalist struggle in the United States between really seeing a kind of white bourgeois family norm as something to aspire to and pursue versus like thinking we could do something very different and very better. Like what what would it mean to actually care for each other? And that there's there's a wonderful long legacy of people trying to form chosen families, trying to depend on extended families, trying to depend on neighborhood and community, and that these both are sort of inspiring and to be celebrated and to be defended, but also run into all these contradictions that have to do with what it means to try to constitute a household in a capitalist society and the uneven access to work, the uneven access to resources, the uneven access to public space and the way this structures power dynamics internally and we can kind of point to the bourgeois white family as like an extreme or particularly horrific example of that or the Christian fundamentalist family but that even in kind of chosen family structures the broader dynamics of trying to survive and reproduce ourselves in a capitalist society are going to torque those relationships distort those relationships and make it very difficult to figure out how to treat each other well, that there's any time we are dependent on people, there's an element, a dynamic of coercion that becomes a part of that, that we have to sort through and we have to sort it through politically and collectively in a way that the family as a structure ends up foreclosing. Thanks for that. And I'm also very excited to read the uh, work on family abolition because I'm also super interested in that. Maybe we can talk about that when it comes out. But yeah, going back to Spillers, I guess, because both both of you mentioned that, like, you know, at the end of Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, Spillers says that the, like, the violent uh, experience of women in chattel slavery made into sort of ungendered, right, is, is how she, he, she ends up talking about it, is also she points to it as a place for rethinking and a kind of resistant understanding, like, and, and reframing a feminism from that experience. So it's like, it's maybe this is what you were referring to as the kind of dialectic of like changing the impact of the state and economic violence that creates the situation of oppression into a place where you can start framing liberation. And I, I see that also that that gets paralleled in you know, in the in the um, 60s, 70s, gay liberation movement and feminism too, as like ways that like the 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 places that are excluded and marginalized are places also to like to form a kind of like resistance. And I wonder to what extent you think that um, trans experience within these structures is also actually like the threat to the the social order that the the right wing would like claim it to be i guess this could get back into that question of capture because it could also be like you know domesticated in a way but yeah i don't know if, if you have thoughts on 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 that like how trans experience like could be liberatory in that way I'm most attentive to the substantial intersection between trans life and poverty. Uh, this is, you know, particularly true of trans people from working class and poor backgrounds. It's particularly true of trans people of color. It's particularly true of trans women that uh, their uh, employment discrimination is quite widespread and quite prevalent. And one of the things I tried to do in my piece is think about how coming out as trans, how transitioning, if you're not able to be very stealth and very closeted and very lucky in pulling that off, and for lots of trans people, sort of being stealth is not a realistic goal, um, that's going to have a huge impact on your employment trajectory, a huge impact on how you're able to reproduce your class position, a huge impact on your economic chances, and that that's true across the board. So you see a sort of downward shift in class position for lots and lots of trans people. And then there's a huge host of trans people from poor and working class backgrounds for whom that, that shift pushes you entirely out of formal employment. That, that getting access to formal wage labor is extremely difficult. And so you see lots and lots of trans people, trans women, 
particularly working class trans women and trans women of color, but it's actually quite a widespread experience for trans women to spend extended periods of time engaging in sex work of various sorts, engaging in criminalized economies and hustles. And then you see these sort of little pockets of employment niches where trans people are able to reproduce themselves with some visibility. And that sort of most closely tied to the world of sex work and criminalized economies, I'd put HIV services a lot of ex-sex workers or current sex workers end up doing HIV prevention services and trans social services sort of tied up with the world of HIV services. So you have all these weird dynamics around fundraising and public health administration and biopolitical surveillance and criminalization tied up with this sort of nonprofit nexus that people might use as a way of exiting out of sex work into like a lower risk, but also much lower paying job often with some stability. And in the Trans Oral History Project, I interviewed several sort of former sex workers working in HIV services now and the kind of dynamic of that trajectory. But you have a few other pockets and those are growing. I'm certainly attentive to social work. There's a presence of trans women in tech. There is sort of as changes open up, these spaces of employment expand. But that the, by and large, the experience of trans life is one of significant economic precarity and that that has so long as that's true, and there's a lot of reason to think it could be mostly true for a long time to come, that has dramatic impact on people's politics, that being ec highly economically marginalized in a situation of, of a dis disappearing welfare state, of hostility and lack of support from your families of origin, of you know very little safety net, puts you in a position where you are relying on friends, you're relying on your sort of own ability to engage in criminalized hustles, and, and makes it very clear that the world is a kind of nightmare that needs to be overcome and needs to be destroyed. And that's not a universal response by any means, but the economic, the experience of economic precarity helps me make sense of why so many trans people end up in political struggles, end up in organizing, end up with anti-capitalist politics of a wide variety, and um, helps me make sense of what, under what hypothetical future conditions are trans people likely to be on the left or to be far left, um, and that the circumstances of our sort of political inclusion, obviously a strata of trans people could be politically included quite quickly, but really depends on the question of employment and economic stability. Yeah, so there's, there's a few different chapters of the book to deal with this uh, question of work, I suppose, as you'd expect from a Marxist collection, <laughs> or hopefully. And um, yeah, I feel like M Michelle, uh, Michelle and Kate, Kate, Kate Dale Griffiths' piece both kind of like, uh, yeah, there's the addressing, addressing this question of of like how yeah how trans people manage to like exist as workers but it's always like I think as Michelle was alluding to it's also like any understanding of trans work has to understand the experience of kind of being out of work long-term unemployment relying on on state resources or perhaps kind of family and friend uh networks and so on so there's also like I'd say also Zoe Belinsky's essay which is called transgender and disabled bodies between pain and the imaginary uh, and in another way, in, in another way, kind of Anya Flowers' essay, The Class Struggle of Proletarian Trans Women, which is kind of looking at this more through, I suppose, like this, that essay is more using this framework of like uh, direct market mediation and indirect kind of in terms of like the reproductive labor. So there's, there's like a bunch of different perspectives kind of addressing this, uh, yeah, this question of both what it means to like exist and make it in a workplace as a trans person and also the very commonplace realities that a lot of the time that's not really like where we end up where we end up is more your industrial reserve army of labor your sort of proletarians in so far as you're stripped from the means of production but not proletarians in so far as you actually have a source of exploited toil which you're <laughs> like reliably committed to so yeah i like uh, like michelle i definitely i definitely consider like us spending so much time in the underbelly of yeah of capital and of its reproduction is definitely like a huge part of why it's such a commonplace to find communist trans people 
or whatever, like leftist, anti-capitalist, whatever you want to call it. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. One, two, one, two, tune in for another episode of Marooncast. Marooncast is a down-to-earth black radical podcast for the people. Our host, hip-hop anarchist Simile the RBG and sex educator and crochet artist KLC share their reflections on maroons, rebellions, womanism, life, culture, community, trap liberation, and everyday ratchetness. They deliver fresh commentary with the queer, trans, gender non-conforming, fierce, funny, southern girls, anti-imperialist, anti-oppression approach. Poly ad and bullshit. Check out episodes of Marooncast on Channel Zero Network, Buzzsprout, SoundCloud, Google, Apple, and Spotify. All power to the people, all pleasure to the people. Peace. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott. You're hearing my conversation with Michelle O'Brien, a contributor, and Jules Gleason, contributor and co-editor of Transgender Marxism, published in May of 2021 by Pluto Press. Or even anar- anarchist trans people, which is the sort of enclave I, I, I inhabit. But yeah, I, I, I like uh, the sort of narrative that you put out, Michelle, puts a, 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 a kind of poses a way that one a trans person could become politicized in a particular way. One of the things that the book in in multiple essays like kind of grapples with is the extent of trying to survive under these conditions in a way that's at least somewhat like bearable versus having the, even that energy or the ability to fight the conditions that create that form of, you know, deathly oppression. And like, I, I think that a lot of the essays do a really good job of like trying to talk about how we can create situations to survive and then also think about where we can fight against them. And a lot of the work, one of the most important things for me reading this whole book and reading everyone's piece is how it, it sort of intervenes within the discussion of social reproduction and like thinking about trans life through care work. So I, I kind of want to, it's something we keep kind of mentioning, but I want to, I wanted to dive more directly into that. So maybe if, if either of you wanted to talk a little bit about how you think um, this, the transgender Marxism reframes social reproduction, like, cause there's a feminist version of that. And I think we're, that you're building on that in here, but doing something different with uh, the specific trans experience and specifically also talking about like transition through this lens. Yeah. Maybe we can just start with just sort of understanding what a trans analysis of social reproduction might be. Yeah. That's an exciting question because social reproduction comes up in this collection in a bunch of different ways. Let me think. Yeah. So, well, like social reproduction kind of appears on several different <laughs> registers across the course of this collection. The first one is in the, yeah, the very first essay by Noah Zazanas, which is called Social Reproduction and Social Cognition, kind of like uh, brings brings that Marxist feminist framework into dialogue with some more sort of mainstream psych kind of approaches to how people develop their identities from a very young age. I guess the different approaches taken in this collection kind of speak to the pretty broad set of approaches that Marxist feminism has increasingly come to deploy. And it's worth mentioning that this is also like social reproduction is not actually a framework which every uh, every Marxist theorist or even every Marxist feminist is really committed to. So it's not exclusively an SRT collection. However, I suppose that the reason which I first came to this framework, to the framework of social reproduction that is like focusing on uh, workforces, like come to be workforces in the first place, like how uh, people come to be laborers and sustain themselves as laborers. The point at which I came to this, I suppose, was exactly in the wake, as I was saying before, of the tipping point and kind of like in, I suppose, as part of my frustration that so few people really were providing any explanation as to why this was happening and that was something I actually found to be very prevalent on the right so right-wing accounts of these things would just depict it as some kind of mysterious degeneration uh, or perhaps an ideological mania but I also was finding that a lot of like social theorists didn't really seem to provide any satisfying or even like even like helpful attempts at kind of working out what was going on so social reproduction was saying which I personally kind of like was like pretty committed to around like 2016. And um, I would say like that a lot of the, a lot of the collection is kind of taking that sort of like meaning of the term and that kind of avenue of inquiry, which is specifically looking at communities and subcultures, if you will. But I would rather say like 
these kind of reproductive circles, like in whatever form, whatever form they take, which provide people collectively with the kind of means of making themselves transgender, uh, which as we've discussed primarily means like surviving as a transgender proletarian, although that's not the only <laughs> variation as we all know. So yeah, so that's kind of like the primary, the primary meaning which I've been interested and in, invested in. But uh, as I say, this isn't like, this isn't like a subtle question and this is kind of like an ongoing discussion within Marxist feminist theory as to like the best terms to use and the best kind of like frameworks and understandings. So yeah, I'm happy to say a lot more about that. I think probably, <laughs> probably both myself and Michelle could talk all day about this one, but I don't know. Yeah, I would, I would distinguish sort of three registers that I think of social reproduction as having a really huge impact on trans life. And I think Jules to some extent referenced each of these. One is um, uh, thinking about the mutual aid networks, the communities of support, the communities of, uh, that when somebody thinks they might be trans or gender questioning or knows with confidence they're trans, they might go out and seek connections with other people to be able to help them think through both their gender identity, a way of thinking about themselves, the concrete steps around transition. And this is, I think, partially why we've seen just a giant increase in the numbers of trans people coming out with a steadily increasing access to the internet, that people, the people on the internet are able to find these communities. And why there are have been particular sort of pockets of trans people for many, many generations who are uh, demographically numerous in highly specific social settings. Like when I came out as trans in 2000, shortly after getting out of college, I looked around, I was in a kind of queer punk scene where there were a lot of trans masculine people and very few trans feminine people. And I looked around the country and I found like three or four other punk trans feminine trans women. And then I moved to Philadelphia and met like 300 black trans women my age who were like the first trans women my age I ever met. And it's because they had this highly developed scene around balls and houses where they really figured out how to enable each other's transitions that like certainly wasn't available in my women's studies department, right? Like in in like my much more privileged background on some level, but really lacking this kind of supportive space and community. And I, you know, had various internet based communities to try to figure out how to do this that have since really flourished and are much, much bigger. So that's one meaning of social reproduction. Another meaning is the kind of violence and tyranny that we might experience in our homes, the dynamics of our family of origin, the household as this private space of reproduction. And so social reproduction has been really key to thinking about anti-trans violence. And then uh, another register of social reproduction is that uh, depending on how you parse it, many people identify various formal wage labor sectors as being really integral to social reproduction. So nurses, teachers, daycare workers, elder care attendants, you know, sort of like all these different people that sort of reproducing humans capable of participating in the labor market and participating in society. And I think for various reasons, you see a lot of gender nonconforming people in these sectors. These are feminized sectors. They are sectors that historically have had lots of women and queer people of various genders. I think there's different kinds of historical dynamics that have brought a fair number of trans people into working in these realms. And that these are realms of intense labor struggle uh, currently. And that some of the dynamics of deindustrialization and the shift to a late service economy, that these are not sectors that are easily automated, that the sort of labor the need for labor is easily reduced. So you really have a growing section in the global north of people working in these kind of labor sectors and that these labor sectors have a lot of potential for uniting and connecting different sectors, strata of the working class and bringing people together in different and complex and rich ways as part of their struggle for working conditions. Thank you, that's, oh, you go ahead. Oh, just one more thing quickly on the connection. I really appreciated that <laughs> that uh, three-part breakdown from Michelle. I suppose one more thing in the collection, one way it appears is like there's this primarily historical essay by Nat Raha, which looks at exactly the kind of movement struggles which uh, brought 
what we now call social reproduction theory kind of into being. And she looks at one of these kind of lesser known groups, a British collective called Wages Due Lesbians, um, which was sort of a, a counterpart of the much better known Wages for Housework. Yeah, and that was kind of like operating in the context of like the British New Right. And that kind of looks at like some kind of overlaps that she perceives between this this group and the much better known um, Star House Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries in New York City. So uh, that's that's like another approach, approach which you can find in the collection. But yeah, as I say, like there's a there's a, at once kind of like a range of different social reproduction theory type outlooks and also people who don't see that. Well, people who see social reproduction theory are saying to talk about in other terms. Anyway. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott. You're hearing my conversation with Michelle O'Brien, a contributor, and Jules Gleason, contributor and co-editor of Transgender Marxism, published in May of 2021 by Pluto Press. Yeah, no, this is, that was all really helpful to kind of think about what a transgender Marxist perspective on social reproduction could look like in, in different ways. And I, again, like, I mean, the last point that you made, Michelle, was talking about another place, like another possible place for politicization, given that trans people and non-binary people or gender non-conforming people um, would be working in specific situations for a kind of potential radicalization. That was interesting to me as another reframing of a, that kind of inherently liberatory perspective that like sometimes gets thrown around and to me seems often like very liberal feeling like just being trans in it in itself is like somehow resistance but you like you sort of discuss more explicitly how how that actually works right um through the kind of work that trans people do in the care work that they do for other people i guess like one thing i might do to like to ask to follow up so like in the you know the visibility in the mainstream the idea of transition then become often becomes individualized right like there's a particular internal experience that needs to be like brought out through transition it often in the like liberal well-meaning pers- uh, perspective will get like brought into the nuclear family that's somehow unchanged by the fact of a transgender child like that when there's a the focus on a supportive family right but the thing that the book really brought out to me that was like i mean in a way it made something way more explicit to me that I personally experienced through transition is how much of this is done through community. And as you said, Michelle, like mutual aid, right? And we see that also in the pandemic, just with like hormones, like when there's a short uh, like supply chain break, people sharing hormones, for example. So I, I wonder if you wanted to talk more about that actual work of transition, because that's something that gets brought up a lot in the in this book. And I, and I thought, it was also a major contribution by a lot of the writers in here to think about the process of transition this way, rather than like the transgender individual who who is somehow exists. I could g- ask more detailed questions, but if you wanna, if you have something to jump in right there, I'll leave it open it to you. This is something that other contributors and other people have thought a lot more about. I I said a little bit about it and sort of thinking about mutual aid support, but I don't have a lot more to. Okay. Um, well, in my essay, I guess this is <laughs> this is one of the ones which tried to address this question. I suppose what my own contribution to the book, my essay in this collection, kind of tries to address. It's just called "How Do Gender Transitions Happen?" And yeah, I think that simultaneously, like you can't do away with either the personal narrative, the personal like process, the very self-directed individualized labor um, which people go through or like the community working but I think it's interesting that these things sort of like somehow they appear to be at odds or they appear as distinct to each other and yet from another view they always unfold at the same time right like you're always drawing from collective resources or at other times like I think as Michelle was saying there's a lot of kind of parallel development there's a lot of different communities which are kind of attempting the much the same thing, much the same trend, process of transition in very di- different contexts and with very different styles. The point which the essay, I guess, is trying to address is how people will tend to sort of switch between these different kind of registers of approaching transition, either as something which is like a set of encounters and something which is continuously happening as you kind of try and negotiate your way through the world, or through the kind of like uh, community rewriting and like re-narrativizing and 
yeah, just the kind of specific stuff which actual circles of transgender people can do together. So going to one of the questions that I wrote, and if this is just sticking with it and you don't have more to say, that's fine. But there's a passage in your introduction that really stuck out to me that uh, transition must come to be understood by revolutionaries as a response to its own form of hunger. The longings that drive so many to reforge lives for ourselves that leave us thoroughly proletarianized or cast out, rendered surplus. And I, I like this statement because I think it, it like leaves behind the kind of gender as a social construction versus essential gender as not even uh, something worth like spending a lot of time on at this point and focuses on the act of transition as politicized, political, and I, I think it gets articulated also as ethical. Um, but one thing that came up for me reading this is like, how do we... Yeah, I mean, I guess there's this like personal political divide. I, I could see this being dismissed as a kind of lifestyleism or self-chosen marginalization, like subcultures often get dismissed, like uh, anarchists or punks. And I wonder if you could talk about the way, I, I, the thing that I really want to pull out of here is the trans desire and, and also like how that position of surplus in capitalism in the state, which is like historically needed for capitalism, to function the way it does, but how that we can rethink that place as a site of inter an insurrection. Yeah, I'll I'll just briefly say that I think desire is really an underappreciated category uh, in liberation movements and the far left. The desire is both sort of far beyond the question of individual choice or individual preference or sort of how we think about sort of market options that. I think in some transphobic conservative left discourse, there's this idea of like people choosing genders in a free way, like uh, a neoliberal subject chooses consumer items. And uh, that I think is a profound trivialization of how deep, how powerful, how transformative, and how uncertain desire is. That desire is very much sort of what sets us in motion uh, in unfolding processes of personal and collective transformation, desire for survival, desire for dignity, desire for recognition, and that these desires are not, they're not trivial sins, they're sins that like are not easily satisfied, they're sins that set us on a, a trajectories that we don't know where we're going to end up and that bring us into alignment and into connection with each other. And that that's just a kind of whole realm, a whole dimension of political struggle that I think trans people, uh, precisely because often most trans people have made a set of personal decisions around changing their gender that were significantly at odds with major sections of our social world, our families, our jobs, whatever that is, and had some clarity that that kind of, that we had a certain one could say truth that we were sort of trying to think through or trying to grapple with that might not be an essential gender or a kind of inner gender, but, but a certain kind of uh, desire in the world. And that that opens up some space for thinking about how the desire functions in terms of the entire working class, in terms of the struggle for the abolition of class society, in terms of the desire to destroy and remake the world. Uh, and that there's, that that's just, we, we need to spend a lot of time listening to that and thinking much harder about that and thinking beyond these categories of sort of like individual choice versus sort of structural determinants. So I suppose we talked about desire and like the talking about things in terms of hunger. I suppose, so this is like a part of the introduction where we're sort of talking about George Bataille, the French theorist, pornographic writer, very heterodox political economist, call him what you will. And um, Bataille exactly kind of like counterposes this, this like effort of previous anti-imperialists prior to Marx who were trying to kind of like elevate things and talk in terms of eagles and surpassing things. Uh, this is a critique of surrealism, by the way, so it's, it's a very eccentric essay, but his point is that Marx is more about the old mole. It's more about the subterranean um, and this kind of like, uh, and specifically he talks about like the hunger of the proletarian bellies being central, central to what Marx was trying to do or like the indispensable feature of that. And um, 
I think this is kind of what I feel is like, I, I sort of feel like the stuff you're alluding to exactly this, like people kind of dismissing the stuff as like questions of lifestyle or marginalization or whatever. This is thing which I feel kind of needs to be addressed, but also it's like the point is that like, even if they're rarely spoken about in the political field, like transitions are the consequence of cravings, breakdowns, like powerful, <laughs> like powerful emotions that make themselves kind of like essential and central to the decisions we make and to the to the things we depart on so you use the word ethical and that's exactly right like it's a transition is always going to be about reshaping your life taking steps and in some way sort of engaging in activities which like transform who you are how you're perceived how you're apprehended how you apprehend yourself so uh i think any kind of approach to trying to do well whatever kind of trans theory that doesn't kind of include that is bound to failure but also I don't necessarily see this as something we have to choose between you know like we know that people seem to be living lives which are filled with kind of like desperation and breakdowns and then they get hold of these basic like endocrinological interventions like they get hold of sex hormones and this transforms uh their lives substantially maybe doesn't solve all their problems of course (laughs) well it never does but um but it transforms the course of their life but that doesn't mean we're not allowed to do a political economy of sex hormones. I've actually been trying to look something up, but I, I can't find it. Was it was it you, Michelle, who wrote this piece on the trajectory of sex hormones that's going going across the world? Because I can remember I was reading this in one of these trans studies readers collections, but this would be an essay from a long time ago, but I can't remember if it was yeah. you or if I was just reading this a long in time. In 2004, I wrote an essay about capitalism and pharmaceutical companies and hormones that then got reproduced uh, many years later in the second Rotledge Transgender Studies Reader. So right, it was a the, very it was long the time ago. One. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tracing <laughs> the Body been... is its name. Mm. Yeah, and a lot of it's kind of talking about the shipping process and the way that the way that these things like move across continents. Yeah, and I think that is 2004, right? So like people have been working on this for a long time. <laughs> so um, this is exactly kind of what I mean. But like, there's no reason to say like, yeah, there's no reason that we can't uh, look at these things in a way which sort of uh, applies an internationalist framework, which looks at how the actual ways that like pharmaceutical com- companies interact with transition, not the kind of like conspiracy theory version where for some reason pharmaceutical companies are trying to profit off incredibly cheap, uh, <laughs> low cost medical treatments. But you know what I mean? Like, like there's, there's no reason that we have to say like, oh, well, there are all of these passionate sensations and there is then this political economy and we have to look at one, one or the other. But like, it's exactly Marx's kind of materialism that we don't accept that as a choice right and it's like these are things which are continuously interacting like people are always trying to sort out their own lives on a very basic level but then they run into this stuff then they run into the reality of having a landlord and having a doctor (laughs) and all of these other kind of like lopsided social relations which um they have to work through so um that's that's what the point about hunger is because as you say i think this is (laughs) this is like a difficult argument to win, but also I think it's like the most important one in a way. Yeah, thanks both of you though, like real beautiful <laughs> answers. And I mean, one, what you just said, Jules, brings up for me also like, not like there's the experience of the relationship of a trans person to the medical and pharmaceutical industry. Also like I, and I'm like trans and also chronically ill and, and you'll get like leftists who will make this kind of argument that like your existence for either of these reasons could not like persist post revolution, whatever vision of a revolution they have, because in some way you are so reliant on this, like these capital systems of production and shipping and et cetera. And, and that, I don't know, that's an interesting dynamic to see the ways that those kinds of genocidal <laughs> ideas can play out within a leftist circle. I don't know if you have more to say about that. And maybe Michelle, that's something that you were talking about in that in that earlier text. Thankfully, there are a lot of people thinking about this and uh, speaking on it. I wrote a piece for Commune magazine called Chunky Communism. And I, uh, in some ways, wrote it. Uh, it's You wouldn't be able to tell this reading the essay. It's a discussion of the young lords and their work in a syringe, ex- uh, doing syringe exchange work and a detox in the South Bronx during the occupation at Lincoln Hospital and uh, sort of how that helped shape harm reduction today. And 
I wrote that essay as in my head as a direct response to a really vicious and a very ableist genocidal framework that I saw amongst Takunis and some other anarchist streams in the United States of like after the revolution, all these disabled people are going to die. And like that gets referenced one way or another. I think it's an intro to civil war that they say that diabetics are objectively counter-revolutionary. And I think there's that's a current in the American far left or in the international far left that really has to be directly combated. And there are various ways that we can challenge that and various ways we can critique it. And the one that I go to is a kind of form of radical communist humanism on some level that that like a fundamental political principle has to be taking each other's lives seriously and taking that the the profound preciousness of lives that are treated as disposable and that part of our political task of communists is uh or as revolutionaries is to really cultivate uh, an ethic of caring for each other, of defending each other's lives, of treating the subtitle in the piece I wrote on commune is no one is disposable. They're really not um, participating in the kind of ranking of the value of life. And the trans, that obviously comes pretty directly out of my experience as a trans person and thinking about sort of trans life as treated as disposable on all these different social registers in the world. I definitely recommend people check out Junkie Communism as well. Yeah, and so in the collection, the essay there is there is an essay on disability, which I've already mentioned by Zoe Belinsky, who is yeah also a diabetic in reference to the Dakunda. And this essay is kind of like approach to this question of disability is pretty phenomenological. So it's looking at the philosophy of experience and um, the main framework which um, Zoe is using is kind of just uh like talking about disability in terms of this sensation of like uh i cannot so maurice meloponti um who is this communist philosopher which um zoe's mostly responding to kind of talked about things in terms of like uh experience and, and our way through the world in terms of like i can so you encounter things and you think well i can rotate this this square 90 degrees uh and that lets you understand the square and so Zoe's kind of like a social account here, sort of looking at exactly where disability kind of arises, where you think, well, I can't, I can't do that. And um, and yeah, I'm really glad that this essay is in there, and I, I'm very, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what people think of it because, uh, needless to say, like like a, a lot of our contributors are chronically ill. I certainly am, um, <laughs> in a way which is like I feel like it never quite works out. It's not just additional to being transgender, is it? It always like overlaps and like uh, interacts with it, and these these things kind of mesh in these very interesting ways. But strangely, I feel like actual extended pieces about disability, like in my circles, are like yeah, kind of unusual. Like as I say, like there's a lot of contributors who don't talk about their experiences with. Uh, chronic conditions, chronic illnesses in this collection who've definitely been through that. So um, I'm hoping that between like the essays we've talked about and, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping that this, this kind of stuff gets developed in the near future because it's definitely something which is increasingly on my mind. I feel like if you don't really have an account of disability and the way which it interacts with people sort of preparing themselves for the workforce, then why not? Like <laughs> this is obviously something which not only like brings people into these struggles and saying that people have to work through like in order to survive but it's also something which has been the site of so much organizing across so many different national contexts and like is like an ongoing point of crisis definitely in britain where i'm from and yeah i can't see i can't see why people would leave this out of their consideration other than maybe like you're kind of like well yeah like to, with in Takun's case i think it's just this sort of like uh, edgy flourishes, you know what I mean? I feel like they just kind of like don't care very much. So they just put the stuff in there to show that they're like uh, badass insurrectionists or whatever. But I think we can do a lot better than that. And I think an honest account of the people who become communists, especially, is going to include a lot of uh, a lot of reflection on um, on this stuff and how it impacts our lives. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott. You're hearing my conversation with Michelle O'Brien, a contributor, and Jules Gleason, contributor and co-editor of Transgender Marxism, published in May of 2021 by Pluto Press. Yeah, I appreciated that kind of 
putting the I can't as the sort of primary experience, which would, yeah, the other people who often make these kinds of arguments are like, whatever, the primitive art anarchists. And, and to like frame that as the originary experience of like of being a human kind of rethinks that like that sort of idea of like there's like a, an essential or integral health before domestication, civilization, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I thought that I, I'm glad you brought up that piece, too, because I, I think that's really important. I did want to go back to the question of desire and, and kind of like bringing us to the relationship between like a trans liberation movement to like the earlier gay liberation movement. One of the things I, I appreciate in the book is that there's an argument against separating gender and sexuality as if they're like two separate fields, which I think in academic discourse became a thing for a while that like gender and sexuality have to be thought of separately. But as like both of you have sort of emphasized the desire inherent in trans gender experience um, and also connecting it to these other readers like when the Bataille it makes me think of like Guy Ockingham talking about Fourier as a way to rethink Marx through like the desire within a kind of economy. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to, I, I guess what I want to hear either of you or both of you talk about is to what extent, so, you know, we're past the kind of end of gay liberation and the ways that it, it had been co-opted. And there's a new, I think there's a, we're in a new era of like uprising and resistance. How does the trans liberation still like theorize desire as revolutionary um, without getting trapped in the um, the sort of, you know, the, the ways that it can be enclosed in, into a kind of liberal uh, understanding of like choices, as, as you put it, Michelle. Um, and I, I had originally written some questions about like the sort of earlier theorists like Ockengem or Mario Mieli thinking about, about like, you know, homosexuality or transsexuality as as the horizon of liberation and as providing sort of the means towards it. So, I, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on these ideas and what we can inherit from that older tradition of gay liberation. Mm, well, I actually have an essay published in Michelle's magazine. Well, Mich Michelle's a <laughs> the, the magazine, which Michelle is a, a founding member of Pinko Mag, which kind of deals with Maria Mielli specifically. And that essay is kind of a sketch of what I want to work on in the future, seeing as Mielli, this Italian gay communist thinker, whose work is mostly from the early 70s. His framework, should I say he or does? I don't know. Uh, Miele's work is definitely like, it uses this term transsexuality, like this notion of transsexuality underlying the homosexual experience. And and uh, yeah, specifically that, that what, what triggers homophobia, what sets it off is that there is this base level of transsexuality that cross-dressing, male-male desire and so on, all these kind of things can like uh, cause the precondition of civilization like transsexuality to kind of peek out and um yeah i love that stuff <laughs> i guess it's, i think it's 1972 1971 1972 that uh that essay so yeah by all means check out that piece in pinko if you want to know what i think about him but in terms of like in terms of like desire which was kind of what you began with i feel like probably what's the most interesting thing is is like why why would people want to do away with desire why would you want to think politics without our desires and without our needs and that is the kind of thing which I feel needs to justify itself. So the reason which, like, the reason I, co I come back to Marxism all the time is that exactly what Marxism seems to provide for me is an account which, yeah, an account which is happy to begin with the commodity, like begin, so this is what Marx begins Capital One with. So he starts with the commodity, he said it, says that the commodities are strange or curious or a queer thing he says for that so like the commodity is like this inscrutable object and the reason it's so strange and the reason you look at it and then you look at it again and <laughs> see something different is because um commodities are on the one hand very simple very straightforward very simple things like you want to have a snack so you buy a, a pack of peanuts there we go what could be simpler than that and yet when you consider them several different times they find that we find that they're kind of like connected to a the super sensual to something which is beyond kind of like uh beyond our immediate experience um like we were saying earlier with with sex hormones there at once there's something you uh need for your satisfaction and yet that also is something which has been shipped from another country fabricated probably in another continent and is being prescribed to you by someone in an authoritative social position so like i feel like this is sort of the way with desire it's like why like <laughs> why do we need to lose it 
Like, why do we need to、um, not talk about these palpable feelings that sort of seem to drive us and seem to like lead us around? Like, why have we got to put those in the cupboard? <laughs> I'm not going to say the closet. Why have we got to like, yeah, get rid of them? And that's that's kind of like that. That's increasingly what I'm not convinced about. I don't think that we need to. And that's kind of like. Yeah, that's that's why like that's why I was putting together a Marxist collection, and that's kind of what、uh, I I hope that the different perspectives we put together sort of mean that we don't. Yeah, you don't need to do that. You can look at things psychoanalytically at one point, and you can <laughs>、uh, you can look at things historically and look at different movements, or you can try and do several things at once. Like, why not? <laughs> Just see what works. Michelle, did you have did you want to respond to that or? Um, yeah, I I don't have a lot to say, but I think this has been a really central concern at Pinko that we're really interested in trying to think through and sort of re re create some of the、uh, uh, to think hard about the legacy of gay liberation. That gay liberationism both、uh, has some really quite extraordinary and very powerful potentials and currents. And I think has、uh, sort of more or less been a catastrophic failure in a lot of ways for thinking about our current moment. And to think those alongside each other in a way that that、um, really tries to draw out、uh, to reload what could be relevant for understanding our era, for understanding、uh, sexual and gender life today. I think Jules's piece is a very powerful example of.、Um, Our efforts at trying to do that as a collective and as a journal, I think this sort of question of the separation of sexual orientation and gender, I think, is、uh, largely relatively unhelpful. That it it sort of belongs to a kind of, even though it was pioneered in circles dominated by continental philosophy, it it really kind of reeks of an analytic attempt at separating out things in distinct categories. That you then can isolate their divisions. Well, you know, really wasn't that long ago that like the idea of homosexual desire abstracted from gender difference was ludicrous.、Uh, that that is an invention of、uh, advanced capitalist society in the 20th century and hasn't yet permeated in lots and lots of places. That you look back on the history of sodomy. And a huge amount of it involved people that were like gender nonconforming in a wide variety of ways, and that the sort of line. I mean, I don't know. I have some problems with it, but I think Andrea Longchu is very interesting for sort of talking about transitioning as being very tied up with. A、uh, scopic desire, with desire of what one sees, of what one wants to become, that I think some、uh, are efforts at avoiding some transphobic discourse around this sort of thing prevents trans people from spending as much time talking about or thinking about as might be helpful.、Um, but that 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 the question of sexual desire and sexual yearning and gender identity are have always been deeply, deeply bound up and. Separating them is a is a kind of elaborate artificial conceptual edifice that we should question. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up that last thing too, just about like the ways that people try to avoid the transphobic discourse to the extent that they like end up maybe repeat or, or like leaving those distinctions in place. But okay, so I guess sort of winding it down, I I, I want to ask my like anarchist question、um, of the, because you 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 know you frame this as a transgender Marxism, and you know like one of the resistance the classical this like resistance between anarchists and and a kind of a version of Marxism is this like historical determinism or these ideas of blueprints and stages, and while I'm like totally open to that being a misreading of Marx, it, it's played out within like authoritarian communist parties, let's say, and 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 I think historically we could see that like gay liberation, the historical gay liberation movement of like the '60s and '70s being a reaction to some of those versions of authoritarian communism. So I appreciated that this book didn't play along those kinds of authoritarian lines, and also like made a lot of space for historical contingency. So I'm wondering, just like. How you all might frame this like materialist account that you really like all the pieces really ground the their analysis from a materialist materialist perspective.、Uh, how do we like bring that into 
relation with unknown historical contingencies, the like future solidarities that we might need to like elaborate, um, and in a particular in, in the particular context of trans struggle, to me like this often is a is a place to like think of a anarchism as a kind of intervention. But I, I'm wondering just what you what you have to say about that. Yeah, I really <laughs> I really really looking forward to this question because it is a juicy one. And um, yeah, I suppose the the very short answer is that I have always found the sectarian divide between communists of the kind uh, I get along with, communists who are my comrades, and anarchists to be very flimsy, even spurious. And <laughs> communism, the, uh, when I use the term, and anarchist positions are remarkably similar and definitely have significantly more common ground than they have divergences and the divergences that do exist are primarily kind of cultural scene history kind of kind of stuff that's how I would put it that's the very short answer the longer answer is I think Marxist communist politics of uh, of the kind I affiliate myself with or the kind I feel connected to uh, have always been implacably anti-state and had a position towards the state which considers like its greatest strengths to also be uh, <laughs> the things that make it the most threatening and most indispensable for capitalists. That is that like the state um, does things which no individual capitalist is able to do and brings capitalist society into existence one generation after the next. Um, so like I, that, that's kind of my position. I also feel like this is becoming a much more common position among Marxist theoreticians. Like um, David McNally really recently had a series about the state um, which was basically uh, <laughs> saying what I just said in a much a lot longer way. Michelle Heinrich um, just had an appearance on the Antifada podcast where he's talking about how the second part of his autobiography, which is across several books, is going to focus heavily on Bakunin and this kind of like much misunderstood antagonistic relationship which Marx and Bakunin had with each other, which actually, again, was like a... <laughs> like a an antagonistic relationship that exactly was sort of over the narcissism of small differences uh, in many cases. And I think that like increasingly this is this is the turn things are taking. Like I don't really like, uh, obviously there is an enormous amount of bad blood between Marxist and anarchist traditions. But in many cases, I think this is like, this is actually like overstated in its substance. And yeah, any kind of, any kind of Marxist perspective, which, which I would like associate myself with is, fully aware of that I suppose one more thing back get getting back to the transgender stuff <laughs> as, as we must it's really remarkable to me how in say 2013's Nevada this this novel by Imogen Binney it's kind of like intuitive that the protagonist Maria is into anarchism and <laughs> I feel like today should probably be like a a commie, maybe a commie cat girl. I don't know. I feel like that's something which has changed um, over the past, like, not a long time, like maybe over the past five years. And I really don't know why. I don't know why that's like, but there are obviously still a lot of transgender anarchists out there. But I feel like now the meme is that we're all communists. So if anyone has any answers to that one, please send me a postcard. Yeah, I, I have always, or there are various ways of parsing a distinction between Marxism and anarchism, and I think most of them are silly and somewhat unhelpful. Um, but I, I define and understand communism uh, as the need to overcome class society, as the yearning, the, the, the pursuit, the real movement that abolishes the existing order of things, and that Marxism is an effort to make sense of how capitalism functions. Um, and that the state, that the sort of statist Marxism, statist communism, this idea of the sort of consolidation of authoritarian ownership-based states that control society through violence and wage labor as somehow a transition to communism, hopefully it was a, a historical blip that we will move past and not have to deal with. And that I mostly uh, don't spend a lot of time in the anarchist tradition, how, whatever, however great my hostility is towards states, 
just because I see the dynamics of capital and political economy as so central to driving the dynamics of human society, of state violence, of state policy, that I find, you know, like even something like police brutality, I find talking about the production of surplus populations as really an essential starting point um, that happens through the dynamics of capitalist wage labor markets over time. So that's, that's my lens of Marxism, less of a sort of statist versus anti-statist, but instead that the kind of starting point of trying to think through the world and what we have to destroy is the dynamics of capitalism. And if an anarchist thinks that, that's, you know, we have a lot to talk about. To bring it back to the book, there's maybe maybe a final question, unless you have more that you want to bring up too. So like, I, I, I appreciate the, the fact that this book isn't only an academic text, right? I mean, it, it, it's connected to academic work, and there's people writing in, in this book who are p- potentially employed by academic institutions, although maybe not comfortably, especially when you're out in trans, which is something I've experienced, um, making me more and more precarious. Um, so I appreciated that, that it, that it um, you know, because Marxism, I think, often gets like lodged in the academy in a way that's maybe not helpful. Um, so I would just wonder about the formation of the book and like how it might be, how it may have come out of like solidarity struggle work or how you think it could tie back into on the ground movement struggle work um, instead of being like set off into the realms of theory that don't connect on the ground as much. Um, yeah, so speaking about how academic the book is, I actually have tried to count up. It's a bit hard to keep track of, but I think like out of the 16 contributors, so we've got like um, 15 chapters, a total of 16 people who wrote for it, including myself and Al. And I think out of those, I think it's three or four lecturers, Jordi Rosenberg, I think, well, I'm not going to name everyone, but I think there's I think about a quarter of a quarter of the a quarter of the book are uh, like our active university university lecturers. I think one contributor, which is Jordi Rosenberg, who wrote the afterword, has tenure. Um, so <laughs> I would say it's primarily not an academic book, but of course this is only part of the picture. I mean, obviously it's informed by academic discourses, and um, a lot of academics are reading it and teaching it. Um, so I think what I would say about that is that's not to me especially surprising. So like the academics we do have like contributing in the main body, like other than the afterward, are primarily not people in the most secure or lasting of positions, like come back in five years time. I don't know. <laughs> so I think that this is actually remarkably similar to the way that things look in trans healthcare, which is that there are an enormous number of people who have some kind of relevant training, whether it's like uh, bio-researchers, registered nurses, and so on, but very few MDs who are transgender. And this is <laughs> the reason why is obvious, like who are the people with the kind of, not only the, the security, the partners or parents to bankroll you through down years or whatever, but also like the connections, right? That would get you through medical school, that would get you onto a tenure direct job and so on. Yeah, exactly all of those connections and those kind of healthy intergenerational bourgeois relationships are what um, transition is is very likely to rupture. Uh, there are of course exceptions, um, but, um, but yeah, there's probably more to be said about uh, trans studies, which is of course something much more expansive than this collection and probably has a kind of uneasy <laughs> relationship in some ways. But that's that's kind of what I would say. I would, uh, like, I think, um, yeah, academia has a very specific set of, like, demands and requirements for people who are ready to exist with it, and that's that it's, like, a very competitive environment uh, where you're not going to be paid reliably for quite a long time. So I, I'm not sure that I would expect, I don't know, I, I feel like that's probably not going to change um, very quickly. And who knows if it would even be a good thing if it did. Yeah, uh, academic life seems kind of like a death trap in some ways. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm I one of many, many, many more or less failed academics sort of trying to write and think in the world. Uh, and that, that uh, there's you know, if if people are able to make a living there, that's great, but it's uh, extremely clear that we need to create 
revolutionary and left spaces of thinking and study and debate and analysis that are outside of academic spaces and academic constraints. Samuel Delaney actually, Samuel Delaney actually recounts, I think in his shorter essays collection. So Samuel Delaney is primarily a sci-fi author, but uh, he talks about how in the later 20th century, he got into academia on the basis that he wanted a steady income, like to supplement his sci-fi career. And I really struggle to imagine anyone doing that these days. Yeah, it's funny. He was, I, I started teaching in the area where he was, which is also where Jordi Rosenberg is in UMass. Yeah. And I'm like, he was like publishing pornographic novels and like <laughs> at the same time. Anyway, well, I feel like we covered a lot and went for a long time. Is there anything that you feel like we missed? I mean, there's so much in this book. Obviously, we missed a lot. But there's anything that you would like to put on the table or bring out into this discussion that I failed to ask you? I feel um, really satisfied. And I, I feel like this is going to give a good account of the book and uh, hopefully entice your listeners who haven't bought a copy yet to do that. I feel really happy. How about you, Michelle? This is great. I already uh, talked about far too much that extends way beyond the book, um, but it's a beautiful collection and a really magnificent set of writers and authors and Jules and Elle just did an excellent, excellent job editing it. And it's a great honor being in it. And I think I highly recommend people sort of being in, interested on the one hand, sort of gender struggles, gender theory, uh, trans liberation, and on the other hand, anyone wrapped up in thinking about capitalism to to buy a copy and to read it and to talk about it uh, and to share about it. Yeah, thank you so much for both of you giving so much breadth to the conversation and, anal- and so much analysis of the structures. And I really appreciate just like thinking about transness through this lens, which often gets left out in the mainstream discussion of it. And even in trans studies, I find it often like disappointing. So this politicization of it is like really important and connecting it to care work and, and the labor experiences of trans people. So I, yeah, I think I, I just appreciate your time and the book. Is there any place that you would want to direct uh, beyond buying the book, which you can get from Pluto Press, like to direct people to follow you or hear more of your work, both of you? You can follow me on Twitter. Like I'm at Social Repro Twitter. Yeah, Social Repro. And um, I also have a Patreon, just patreon.com slash queercom, com with two M's. And I think that's everything from me. I am Gender Horizon on Twitter, and uh, I think I'm uh, I'm looking up my Patreon. I don't remember it. Emmy O'Brien, Gender Horizon, one of those. Anyhow, my apologies. It's okay. I'll we'll include the links in the posting too. If you like what we do here, here at the Final Straw, and want to support our ongoing efforts and transcription of each episode, consider a one-time or ongoing donation, or purchasing merch via the options listed at https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash support, or by clicking the donate link on our website. No money? No problem. Contact us, follow and share us on social media, tell your friends and comrades about us, and rate and follow us on some of the links at https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash links or wherever you find us. And if you have a community radio station in your area that you'd want to hear us broadcast on, as always, reach out to us and or them and check out https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash radio or our radio tab for more information on how to get started. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.